good. Well, let's get started. Um, this is the basic introduction to commercial real estate class. I'm your instructor, Donald Shapiro, AKA they call me Commercial Don. So you, as you guys know, those of you on the web, if you have questions, feel free to type them in. George is behind the computer and he'll ask me the question and I'll be able to answer it. And you guys, of course, if you have questions, answer it and I'll definitely stop answering. So I've been with George for about six years now. I want to tell you a little bit uh, about my background, my story. Started off in residential actually, and this kind of relates back to learning commercial. Um, so one of my, my first or second deals were showing rental property, and of course, you know, you're nervous, you know, how's everything gonna go? Everybody knows how their first showing went. So my, my first or second showing, as I mentioned, I had shown um, some people an apartment. They were down here strictly to rent an apartment. We saw a bunch that day. Um, uh, they actually made an offer on one, and it turns out that I actually had wrote up the wrong lease to another unit, <coughs> which, Imagine your first deal, you, you already are messing up. So I called George, it's a whole thing, I'm stressed out. Um, it all worked out at the end. But the bottom line is, is don't be scared to jump into com you know, to, uh, to commercial real estate. Jump right in and just dive in the water. So you can imagine, you know, I rented this apartment. They actually had built a wall in the apartment in the wrong unit and it was just a fiasco. But anyway, um, so, uh, another residential person came along and I rented an apartment, I did a good job, obviously I learned from my mistake, and he said, hey listen, I need an office space, can you help me? Well, at the time, obviously I had no clue what I was doing. Mm -hmm. Researched the, the buildings in the commercial, on the screen, we're gonna learn how to close the commercial real estate deals. It's kind of like a crash course where you don't have to be an expert, you know, we're gonna give you the tools and knowledge to close them. Let me just throw up a few stats. Average leasing commission, anybody wanna take a guess? 10%. Nah, the average leasing commission. So the average rental commission, I mean, probably what? A grand, let's call it. Half a long, 5%. Average sales commission, any guesses? 11K. So you can see there's, uh, there's some money to be made. So don't let money slip through your fingers this year. Well, not pennies. So the Aria Save it agent here at the office. We have the tools to you know to succeed. A lot of you guys know. I see there's a few veterans in the house, but you know we have Bluepnet, we have CoStar, we have Facebook, we have access to the Miami Realtors. They have commercial conferences every month where they basically have properties that you talk about. If you have a listing, you can go um, biz by sell. I know you've sold a few businesses on there. So if you don't know these logos. Um, I can of course send the presentation, but get familiar with these. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the PPF logos on it. The PPF. Uh, you might want to add that too. Okay, we'll, we'll add that to the next presentation. So this is a true story. A year into doing commercial real estate, actually, uh, I had you know I had gotten a residential renter um, uh, an apartment building, and they said, oh well, I think my office is actually looking for um, to expand, and I said, oh really? Well, you know, I'm in the area. I could help you. I ended up meeting with the right person. She, she, this lady got me to uh, the CEO of the company, which was a, a mortgage company. They had a beautiful office at the Wells, uh, uh, the Wachovia Center at the time. And it ended up, you know, I meet with the right person and you know, a few months later, closed the deal, $40,000 commission. This was a five-year lease, a class A building, you know, thousands of square feet. So just know that while you're doing these residential deals, people um, you know, have access to the commercial field, whether it's, you know, it's, oh, uh, at, at my office, we're actually looking to expand. Oh, at this retail location, we're looking to open several more stores. So just mentally think and note that you can you know, piggyback deals off of your residential. And this is a great example. I mean, if I never took the leap of faith into commercial, then uh, you know, this would have never happened. So, types of commercial real estate we're gonna go over today. Land, as you know, I call it the white tiger of real estate because it's rare now. Um, I'll get into that. Apartment buildings, multifamily. Industrial, we'll go over that. Medley, Hialeah, those areas. Kind of the lingo and terms you should know. Office, class A, class B, class C. Retail, you guys will learn about. Um, also gonna tell you a little bit of scoop on how to maybe get your client into the malls because the malls are a different ball game. It's not like they have, you know, oh, here's the listing, it's listed, and then you can go there and get the commission now. A lot more politics, but we can talk about that. 
hotel, motel, very management intensive. Make sure you know the person maybe knows what they're doing uh, before they get involved. And then specialty brokerage. Um, I, I've done self storage deals, but other deals could be churches and um, you know other type of things. So we'll get into that. So I'm going to go into land. Land, as you guys know, long term investment. Um, people who have bought land and they've held it for 10, 20 years, if they cash out on it, they can get a huge return. Just think of those guys in Wynwood, right? They bought the land 10 years ago. It was, nothing was there. It was a dangerous neighborhood. Now, some of them sell the land. They bought it for 500 grand. They sold it for maybe $20 million. So it's crazy. Lack of liquidity. There's no building on it, so it's not like you can refinance land. Um, I call it the white tiger of real estate because a lot of us are looking for land nowadays, but it's, it's very rare to find. It's, it's hard to find. So you've got to really understand land and you know, know that. Understand the zoning. This is my important, most important thing you need to understand. Each specific city might have their own specific zoning, meaning Miami Gardens has different zoning than the city of Miami. Actually, City of Miami is pretty easy as far as their zoning laws and how to go about it, but if you go to the city, they have no, you know, they're, you could wait a line for hours. Um, the best thing to do, to tell you the truth, when you're trying to determine the zoning or what can go there, you want to go to the city, you want to go there early in the morning, get up at 7 o'clock, grab your cortadito, colada, whatever you drink, go out or wait in line and meet with someone and find out in layman's terms, and when I say layman's terms, Oh, can we build this type of building here, multifamily? What are the restrictions? Because you can look up the code, but the code is written in a way that it's like Chinese. It and you can get it switched. The zoning you can change. The zoning you can change, especially. Yeah, I always recommend you know speaking with the zoning attorney about that because obviously you know it's um, it's very vague. So at the bottom of, of this slide, you'll see you might want to jot these down. MiamiDade.gov. Who are they? You're so popular. I know, right? Thank you. I'm gonna get you so at the bottom of this site, you can write these down. What I like to do is, if it's in Miami, you go to miamiday.gov, pull up the property, um, the tax records, look at the zoning, and then from there, you can take it to Unicode or Miami21. Or if you don't know, you know, if it's a specific city, if it's city of North Miami, Aventura Homestead, call them, figure out where the department is, you know, and then you want to visit them in person because zoning can be very complex. Um, sometimes it can say commercial, but it doesn't allow you to have your specific use. I learned this when I did a, like a self storage deal that I had to get a warrant. A warrant basically is an application process and you have to apply for it and over time it gets approved. Then you can build your thing. So last thing you want to do is have your client, oh, it is commercial and then go under contract and find out you need this special special warrant or use or variance, whatever you want to call it, to get the deal done. So do your homework before. Last thing you want to do is, you know, waste time and look stupid because you might lose that if you, you know, all of a sudden say, well listen, sorry, we just spent the last month doing comps, writing out LOI, doing all this, and now all of a sudden, you know, we, we can't even do this. You know so, that gets worse going to one of those permanent expeditors? Better than you taking up all yes, the Yes, permit expeditors are, are great, but permit expeditors is it's kind of um, because they know what's you're going already on. Already set, exactly. You're yeah. already set in, in the way like what you're going to build. They're just uh, facilitating the process to make it go quicker. But you never used them beforehand to not even get involved with anyone. Yeah, a, a lot of times inspectors. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you know they can help you too, mm -hmm. but you know I, I really recommend if it's something hands -on. that's yeah hands on, so you learn number one. Number two, if it's something specific, um, you know, you might want to have your clients consult with the zoning attorney. We don't want to give, as brokers, mm -hmm. we don't ever want to say something that's wrong. We want to, we don't want to give, you know, mm -hmm. legal advice. I always say that I don't give legal advice because mm -hmm. I don't want to step, you know, in, in a puddle if I don't need to. So that's my take on that. Um, multi-family, you guys know, under one roof, multiple units, uh, apartment buildings. A lot of the time, if your clients may be looking for, you know, a hundred or they have deep pockets, these properties most likely are not listed. So 
you know, and they're usually bought by institutional investors and these huge companies. So to f for the scope of our introduction, I'm gonna keep it to those small multifamilies, those eight, you know, eight to 100 units, but those really large deals, you know, they're kind of hard to uh, find. So those are management intensive, meaning, you know, you need to have someone on site usually all the time. We also offer management services, that's a whole other class, but, um, you know, we, we, we offer that as well. Do we still have that website? That I do believe we have the website. But it, had, it hasn't been updated or nothing? No, we'll ask George sure. about that. Um, a lot of people are, you know, looking for these uh, investments in multifamily. They're hard to find out because the inventory has shrank. So kind of, it used to be you can find properties, um, their cap rate or their return would be, you know, 10, around 10% higher. Now, I mean, you're lucky if you find 6% and something solid. So, um, you know, basically that's kind of how that is. There's tax benefits as well, these type of properties. I'm actually gonna go through an example of a property that I own, which is my building, Commercial Don's building. Um, uh, you guys might know of it, 123 Miami Heat Street. Um, so this building um, has a rent roll, and rent roll is basically the breakdown of the units. It's got eight units. There's four two bedrooms, four one bedrooms, all right? That's how much I get from each. Two grand, 1,400. So add those numbers up, times it by 12, you're gonna get your annual income. So your gross income. Um, vacancy loss. That is basically what I'm estimating per year that there's gonna be someone not in the unit. So in this example, I took 10%. Um, I, t I, I usually, with investors and clients, I go conservative because I don't want their expectations to be high. So I go conservative, but sometimes they could be 5%, sometimes they could be more. That just depends on the year. Maybe you have a soda machine, you know, maybe you have something else that pay for parking. Um, that's gonna give you your EGI, effective gross income, add all that up. But for terms, you know, our class basically, the most important figure is your NOI, which is your net operating income. So if an investor asks you, what's the NOI? You can tell them, you know, the dollar amount, or you can even give them the cap rate, which would be a percentage. It's almost like the return. Um, so, expenses. You're gonna have your insurance, you know, basically, again, you're not gonna quote anything really. You're gonna tell your investor, just ask for an insurance quote. Um, your property taxes, you can pull up the last year taxes, see what they are. People ask me, oh, well, if you purchase a property, what is the new taxes gonna be? I would say about 2%, George-ish. So that, yeah, that, that's what you can kind of quote your clients. You can factor that in. And I also have a template that I can give you guys and you can you know, do your own calculations. So I think 2% of the assessed value. Yeah, 2% of the new purchase value, I usually use. Mm -hmm. So, because, you know, say it's 500 grand on the website and then you buy it for 900, most likely be on the 900. city the next year is gonna take into account the rising price and, you know, et cetera. It wouldn't be the assessed value, it wouldn't be the, property, yeah. the mm -hmm. property that was assessed or bought. Correct. Correct, correct. It's always gonna keep rising as long as the prices go up. Um, you have your management fees. Management, so you guys know, generally 10% of the gross income. Water, lawn, I mean, there's tons of things. Debt service, that's basically just mortgage. So if you take a mortgage out on the property, that's gonna eat up a bunch of your income. And, um, you know, you, you'd enter it there. I bought this property cash, so that's why I have zero. Now, in the event I did have a mortgage, and my income was higher than my total expenses, that's called positive leverage. I'm using the bank's money plus the income, and I'm having positive dollars. So if you hear the term positive leverage, that just means there's a mortgage on the income property and you have more dollars in income. So, so you have more dollars than going out. Yeah, exactly. You're using positive leverage. You're using the bank as leverage. And you know, so, um, What's a good cap rate in this market? Like I mentioned, it's tough because, you know, the market's been shrinking, but, you know, there's deals out there, you just gotta find them, which I'm gonna talk about later, how to hunt for deals. So that's multifamily in a nutshell. Know kind of how the breakdown works, 
you know how to talk to your you know your potential client. Anybody have any questions about multifamily? Yeah, what's a what's a conservative vacancy loss like? Uh, 10%? Yeah, I use ten percent. Ten percent. Yeah, okay. I mean it depends. You know, some people may put five percent and make it look pretty, but right, exactly. Know, but ten is generally. A, I use ten. I always go conservative and explain to my client that I'm going conservative, so it makes me look uh, you know better. But sometimes. You know, people will send you these financial statements and they'll put two percent, and you're like, "Is that realistic?" You know? No. What, what would you recommend if the place is already hundred percent occupied? Would you just put it at zero? Or Wait, you can yeah. because the turnaround time that they're getting moving out to then move in, you're still losing. What I'm seeing is they're occupied, the tenants are still going to stay there. So. Yeah, I mean, if it's a hundred percent occupied building, his question was, "What if it's there's no vacancy?" If it's a hundred percent occupied building, then yeah, you show them it's hundred percent. If they've been there for, if they have a track record, then you know that these people are probably not moving, but maybe, you know, their rents have stayed the same. So realistically, if you're buying a building to raise rents, mm -hmm. then you might have an occupancy, you know. A vacancy, yeah. I'm sorry. And that, that way it just seems more attractive. So. I agree, yeah. Uh, industrial, so these are these uh, buildings. A lot of them you'll see in Hialeah, Medley Doral. Low management because they're not like a bunch of, you know, you can have a bunch of units, but they're not like there's tenants calling you every day. Um, understanding the zoning here is key too because certain type of companies might have certain requirements for industrial. So for example, you wanna learn the language of kind of industrial. What is street level versus dock height? Well, street level is you have a truck and it's basically from the bottom up. Dock height is they actually pull into a ramp and they go right off the ramp into that warehouse. So know those two basic terms because that affects the person's operation. They have an 18 wheeler, they need dock height. You can't show them anything with street height. That's completely a no-no. Um, so other people might need grease traps, spray booths, they might need special permits for these. So when you're talking to the industrial client, you know, either in the buying or selling side, listen for certain things they have that's relative to their operations which is very important. Um, so, you know, like I mentioned, medley area. There's also some areas that might have industrial that might be very valuable moving forward in the future. Wynwood was one of them, all those areas with industrial now. Oh, they're actually transforming to retail, um, you know, and flex spaces. Also, Bird Road Art District was another one. Imagine, you know, people 10 years back, they thought, oh, well, this area is just industrial. Now, all of a sudden, there's art galleries and it's more of a retail feel. So maybe in the future, if your clients are looking, you try to find an area where there's industrial and it's surrounded by non-industrial. That's kind of a tip that I think of. You know. 137 right there. Say yeah. 137 in the street. Yeah, there you go. I mean, there's, like, if you have a industrial in a residential area or something, it could be like a diamond in a rough is what I'm kind of, kind of saying. Flex space, if you hear flex space, you just know that a portion of the industrial will have an office or showroom or some type of retail. So it's kind of like a hybrid, I like to call it. Um, know that industrial rents, depending on the area, are gonna be a lot lower than your office. You're not gonna be paying $20 a square foot for you know, uh, a warehouse. You're gonna be in that five to 15 range, I would call it. Um, so that's kind of my little industrial segment we'll go to. Office, you guys know office. It's broken down into three categories, class A, class B, class C. A is obviously the best, you know, most high tech, uh, nicest. Class C is maybe older, it needs improvements. Um, parking ratio, what is the parking ratio? They normally quote you per, per 1,000 square feet. So if they say, I want a parking ratio, of four to one, that just means for every thousand square feet, you have four spots. And the same goes with, with, with. Yeah, 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 I mean, you can do parking ratios, just know that. So if someone says, oh, I need a parking ratio of four to one, well, you know it's based off every thousand. So that just kind of lets you know. Um, let's talk a little bit about triple net versus gross, which a lot of people might know and, and you know, so forth. So I'm gonna make it very simple because um, for the scope of this class, triple net versus gross is very easy to understand. So 
gross, if they quote you a price in a commercial, you're always quoted price per square foot. So, for example, $20 gross. You know that your client is going to pay $20 times however many square feet they're in, 1,000 square foot office, all right? That's going to give you the annual figure, and then you divide by 12. Um, triple net is different. You're going to have a base rent plus another charge, which is called a net charge. So for this class, say it's $20 triple net. So if they say $20, you're going to ask them what their triple net charge is. They might say $5. So basically, you're just going to add these two together, get $25, then times it by the amount of space they have. What tri triple net is, is your taxes, your insurance, and your maintenance. But it's broken down per square foot for the prorated share. So I'm gonna give you guys an easy example so you can kind of understand better. You have a building, right? You have a common area, which I was gonna call it CA, which is a common area. Then you have four tenants, each a thousand square feet. All right, the owner of the building has his insurance policy. It's $10,000 a year. Then he has his taxes, $20,000 a year. Then he has his, his maintenance for the building, right? He's gotta take care of the lawn, he's gotta have a security guard, he's gotta um, you know, make sure that there's a, if there's a service call, that's $10,000 a year he pays. What he's essentially doing to get this triple net number that he's passing on, he's adding up all these figures, then he's dividing them by the square foot of the building, and each tenant who has their percentage is gonna pay their amount. So, for example, if you add all these up, right, then each portion of, of the office, they pay their prorated. So, for landlords, it's less risky to have um, this format. In other words, he's passing on his insurance and taxes and maintenance to the tenant. They're only paying their portion of space use. If it was gross, then he's just taking one number, quoting you, and then you know, you're know you paying. That, that's gonna be in included into his rent? Yeah, so if he's quoting you triple net, you're basically taking two figures and you're adding them together. You're taking his, his triple, triple net, net charge okay. plus his base rent. Tell me, so the common area is not divided by the he doesn't include, I thought he included the whole thing, even the common area. Yeah, he includes it, but you're basically paying your portion per oh, that you use. Oh, okay, so he doesn't calculate the, the no. common area, he only charges you for... for right, rent. right. So for landlords, let me just explain why this, why landlords usually give you a triple net. Because if something changes year by year, say... The, say the taxes. Right, the taxes, right? Mm -hmm. Donald Trump becomes president and doubles everybody taxes. Let's give a crazy example, right? So he doubles the taxes. Now the landlord has less risk because he's gonna pass on those charges to the tenant. If he had a grossly structure and they all signed five-year leases, he's stuck with the taxes. Make sense? So for our class, if, if it's a triple net, they say, oh, what's the lease structure triple net? Ask them, what's their base rent? what's their, their net charge or their pass-through. Add those together and then you can calculate your rent. And they never calculate the actual, they only calculate the improvement on the problem. They don't calculate like the whole property lot, right? What do you mean by like improvement? Like? When he's doing that, that math, yeah. as I was talking to a landlord, just do the improvement, not the whole lot, right? I, I kind of think I get what you're saying, but I think it's gonna tie into what I'm coming about next. Question. Okay, the um, triple net. Changes every year, though, right? It or changes every year. Thank you for bringing that up. So at the end of the year, say um, the landlord is going through his expenses and the triple net charge is more, meaning at the end of the year he got his taxes and they were more than what he calculated because he usually does the year before. He'll actually give the tenant a bill at the end of the year for you know whatever the amount is and then they have to pay. If it's less, he has to give back the tenants the um, the money. So. Just know that this is, it's kind of a legal thing in the lease that make sure that your tenants are covered and vice versa if you're the landlord, make is, sure. Would that be capped? Is it capped? 
Yes, there is sometimes caps that, that go into the what the triple net can rise by. 5% is usually what I've seen. And you only get paid commission on the base rent? Sometimes you get paid on triple net. Yeah? Yeah. Um, it just depends. Are you negotiating? Yeah. Commercial bank is paid on triple net. Yeah. yeah. George, have there been any questions? Uh, and how common is the, the triple net versus the. For office, it's very common to have triple net. I mean, if I'm representing a landlord, I want to have triple net because I want to pass the risk on to the tenants. You know? So just know that. Um, it's very common. So the you're asking, um, are, are you done for question and answers? No, no, I, I'm open to the office questions right now. Hold your questions. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so that's that. Okay. So um, medical, I want to talk about medical because not every building and office can have medical. So you got to make sure that, check with the city again, that it's medical. Some buildings don't want you to have operations in medical and you've already shot yourself in the foot. So make sure you do this kind of research before you send properties or you speak to clients, because medical is one of those things that gets scrutinized. So that would be zone for medical specific? Yes, yes. Um, or they're, they're, they allow like a specific use for medical. That's what you can hear from. So. Does that have to do with water uses and stuff like that? Or? Like as far as, like what do you mean water like uses? No, it. it's mainly because um, you know, if there's any like operation and they maybe have chemicals or something like that, they don't want the built land. Bio, the bio hazards and things hazard, like that. Hazard, hazardous yeah, material, hazard. exactly. Okay, okay. Um, always get the floor plan. You know, floor plans are great to have. They, they can show uh, you know, your client the exact layout. Rent abatement, basically what that is, is a period of, let's call it free rent. Exactly, so if you hear the term rent abatement, that's free rent. TI dollars, normally landlords give you a TI dollar amount. Basically, TI is tenant improvement. So your client's gonna come in, they're gonna sign a five-year lease, but their front area, they need to move around. So the landlord has agreed to give you a certain amount of dollars to improve that space. So if the landlord says, I'm gonna give you TI dollars in the amount of $5 a square foot, well, five times a thousand is, they're gonna give you $5,000 to help with the build out. And this is usually given in draws. So they're gonna give you, you're gonna pay for the carpet, let's say, $1,000. Give the landlord a receipt, he's gonna give you back 1,000. So it's, it depends on your lease structure, but it's normally paid in draws. Just know that you can negotiate TI dollars and get TI dollars for your, your client. Look like a hero. So it's not a discount, it's actually a, like a rebate. Yeah, exactly, towards improving the property because at the end of the, the lease, the landlord owns the improvement. Right. Does the landlord deduct all of those things off his taxes? Like, is it a tax right off? I'm that sure, I'm sure. Yeah? Um, That's yeah. one way to pitch it to them if they don't want to do it. Right. Let's talk about small offices, office suites. Um, Regis is a good one. If, if you're, you have one person that's looking for an executive office, if you call Regis, they sometimes have these little suites and the offices they built out and they pay good commissions. Also, there's shared workspace, WeWork, and there's a few other once you can just Google shared workspace where that's basically a common area, sit down and park your computer. You can get paid on these things. Just make sure you register yourself. Meaning, whoever you speak to on the company end, you say, hi, my name's Donald Shapiro. I want to register myself as a broker for this client. Note that you have to register yourself because the last thing these companies want to do is pay us a fee. So if the client calls them directly, they're not going to honor you crap. They're just going to close the deal. Lease terms, commercial, usually one to five years, um, you know, which is common. Sometimes if they want to do longer years, 10 years, they can. But just know that in commercial, it's not like a one year lease. Normal time it's longer and you get paid on the whole life of lease, which I'll get into at the end because that's the best part. Retail, so you have shopping centers, you have freestanding locations, you have malls. These all are classified as retail locations. Um, anchor tenants, when you hear of an anchor, that just means who's the largest tenant in the shopping center. You know, if you're selling, you wanna, you wanna really scrutinize the anchor tenant because if the anchor tenant goes out of business, then you have a huge vacancy mm -hmm. and your client's stuck with this shopping center that has, let's call it an office max, because I feel like those have been going out of business. What do you do, you know? 
So note that anchor tenants should be scrutinized. You should know all about them from a lease standpoint and from a landlord standpoint. Because if you're leasing a building and the office max goes out of business, well, that's gonna look bad when people drive by. You have a little boutique store and then you have a huge space that's just wide open, you know? So scrutinize that. Um, tenants are usually qualified on the credit. So if it's AAA, that just means the really good. CBS is AAA, Best Buy, you know, and there's a whole there's a whole rating system you can Google about credit tenants. Um, cap rates, not so much anymore, they're hard to find. But sometimes investors, they want to have a safe investment. So what they do is they look for single tenant retail locations. Walgreens is one of them. Sometimes you can buy Walgreens, but the cap rates are low. They're 4%, 5%. But you know that this company's strong. They're a triple A credit tenant. They signed a 20 year lease. Um, so that's good. Small strip centers, those are most common to find. The key there is, you know, you want to have good tenants, but obviously, um, you know, there can be higher vacancies as well. So <clears throat> I know a lot of people ask me, oh, I want a shopping center with, you know, a good Publix or something. Most likely, those are going to be upwards of $20 million and they're going to be very hard to find and you're going to need to try to find them off market. So um, for the scope of this class, think of shopping centers, little strip centers, a few million dollars, and then you, you know, eventually if you have a listing, you want to fill those retail locations with good tenants that have good credit and have multiple locations and I can talk about it all day. Types of leases, they have gross leases, they have triple net leases, which I mentioned. They also have what's something called percentage leases, um, which a lot of the, the big retail people do. Percentage leases is basically, you're giving the landlord extra rent for sales, right? So they have something called a break point. Is that like a, a, a percentage off the profits that they make? Mm -hmm. Yes, essentially. They, uh, when you're negotiating the terms, they have a break point, um, or an overage point it's called. So for example, um, let's say Dino has a boutique store. She has one million dollars in sales, right? And the landlord says, "Well, that's the break point." So if Dino has a bad year, she sells any under a million dollars, then she just pays for her normal rent, whether it's gross or triple net. If it's higher, say she sells two million dollars, well, the landlord might try to get you to pay percentage rent. Normally, percentage rent is between two, four, six, eight. Very rarely have I seen a 10%. So what that means is, um, if you know, let's say she had a great year, like I mentioned, she made $2 million. That extra million dollars, the landlord would say his percentage rate is 5%. So 5% of a million dollars is 50,000. That means at the end of the year, Dino has to give the landlord $50,000 in extra percentage rent. You usually see these when you're in a retail location that's a mall, Lincoln Road, a big, a big shopping center. Bar uh, restaurants, what'd you say? Bar Harbor. Yeah, Bal Harbor, I'm sure. Yeah, I was gonna say, I, I, the only time I got presented with a percentage lease was in Midtown, my client didn't want to do it. In your experience, the landlords that are trying to push for percentage lease, how easy is it to get into sidestep and get into another kind of, you know, structure? Here's the thing, if they have percentage rent and they're huge, you know, they're Lincoln Road, or they're a mall, or they're a really good retail shopping area, you're gonna have to pay percentage rent, bottom line. So there's no way to say There's no way, you can't yeah. say no, I don't feel like paying it. Yeah. I mean, unless you're Apple, then you can do whatever you want. But, um, but Publix does is they open one in the other corner because they don't sign a restriction on an area. Yeah, yeah, and Publix. And Walmart see, does the same thing. They build three around like five mile radius. Sure, so sure. They eat each other up, so. What you can negotiate, I will tell you, is your break point. You know, you know your own business, your client. So, you know, might say a million dollars. Well, that's too low. I mean, you know, I can do a million and five easily. So, you want to have that as from the rep point of view, have it go higher, mm -hmm. or you can negotiate the percentage that they're paying. So the landlord said, "Oh, I want to pay five percent." Well, you can come back and say, "I only want to pay four percent." So just know those things are negotiable. The break point and the percentage you're paying on the percentage. Right? Did you talk about a break point in your lease? Uh, we, we didn't get that far. My client wanted to do a, a gross lease. Yeah, there's something called a natural break point, which 
you can write it down. It's basically a calculation that gets you to like a break point of your sales based on your rents. And it's, it's an, out, a little bit out of the scope of this class, but I can talk about that. Um, hotel, motel. So, you know, these are very common to find as well for sale. A lot of the big motels, um, you know, the resorts and stuff, those get traded off market, like I mentioned. But the little ones, um, I've seen a lot of um, action on these actually. They're very management intensive. You know, you need to have someone there at the front desk, answering the phones, etc. So, have your client know that if they're going to buy this investment, to have management, you know, as a backup plan, a higher professional. Because the last thing you want to do is, oh, I found a good deal on a, a motel. Clients may be foreign. They buy the motel, and then they get there, and then all of a sudden, you know. They're losing vacants, you know, they're losing rooms, and it's just craziness. So make sure you understand that you need a professional handle, you know, these or experience. One trend that I've noticed is the more active the landlord is in his investment, the higher rate of return. So right. Imagine the activity in a hotel, it's daily. So right. that, imagine that rate of return. Also, there's I mean there's high returns in these motels and hotels. So if you have a good manager and you find, you know, your clients, they're gonna get a lot of money back and they're gonna buy more more things from you or you sell them, you know, you fill them up and you sell them, vice versa. Um, they're complex transactions. Obviously, when it comes to the contract, lawyer, 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 remember, um, you know, these things, we don't want to give legal advice. Specialty brokerages, um, these are your other ones that you hear about and you don't hear about. Uh, adult congregate living facilities, nursing homes, amusement facilities. We can all sell these. These are commercial real estate where we can help someone buy them. You just need to you know, uh, research the zoning, like I mentioned, and know a little bit about the business. You don't need to be an expert in it, you know, but just know. But you know what, you don't have to be an expert, but you have to be resourceful. Right, and you need to, you need to understand, how, I call it the lingo, the language. You, know, you need to kind of know the terms on how these transactions work. So that's just basic. So I'm gonna go over some basic terms, definitions, really basic stuff. Types of rent, gross. If it's gross, most likely know that the landlord's paying all the expenses, but you're gonna be responsible for your own utilities. <clears throat> you might hear the term modified gross, which means that it's a gross lease, but it's modified, meaning that the tenant has to pay for their own electricity, or there's some extra thing the tenant has to pay for. Full service, if you're here full service, um, know that everything's oh, covered. Yeah. Everything's covered, full service. A lot of these small, I mentioned Regis and WeWork Group, you're paying one rate, everything's included. The internet, the water, electricity, etc. Net lease, triple net, I mentioned. Remember, triple net just means tax, taxes, insurance, maintenance, these three combined equal that NNN. And remember, NNN plus your base gives you your amounts. Percentage lease, I already went over that. That's very common in retail. Ground lease, anybody know what that is? Yes, so a ground lease um, is a very long term lease, 40 to 50 years. A lot of fast food places, McDonald's, Burger King, um, banks, gas stations, they sign a ground lease. What are ground leases? Least really is. is you know what? You have, share with them a little bit about the deal that, 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 sure. that, that fell off, that, that is falling apart, but it's a great opportunity. Can you just a summary? Sure, absolutely. I, I recently um, been working on a, a fast food deal, a new concept out of Brazil. They're actually the second largest fast food chain in Brazil. They're called the Bibis. They're an Arabic fast food chain. They're the largest in the world. They want to come to the United States and they want to become the next Burger King, let's call it. So um, we're looking for sites, but we're not looking for any type of sites. We're looking for corners, intersections. So imagine, you know, your Lejeune and Bird Road and your 8th Street and Palms here. Um, if you guys ever have noticed, every damn corner has a fast food place or, gas, or gas a gas station, station, right? Or a Starbucks. Or, or a bank. Or a Starbucks <laughs> now. It's crazy. So the owner of these properties, they don't, they don't ever sell these properties because they know they can have them for long term and have the income. So very, very hard to find these locations to just do. So what the tenant does is they do a ground lease. They basically 
build their own building, you know, and they sign a long-term lease, but it's only for the land, meaning at the end of the lease term, the landlord owns the building. It's, it's crazy if you're, you know, but to get that corner, that prime time corner that has 100,000 cars a day, that's what you have to do. So that's what a ground lease is. So they're responsible for everything. Normally they're responsible for everything. I mean, you know, it's a prime corner. Ground lease owners usually have a very low cap rate. Right, they have a very low cap rate. It's consistent for right. the first 20 years. I mean, imagine, 50 year lease. Hmm. I mean, if you're a landlord, a 50 year lease, you're getting X amount of dollars. The credit tenants, yeah. Yeah, the credit tenant, I mean, that's why the gas stations, Chevron, Shell, hmm. McDonald's, Burger King. So that's what a ground lease is. Um, most of you guys probably won't run into these, but if you do, you know, talking you about paid a commission in all 50 years. You don't get paid a commission <laughs> normally on all 50 years, but you do get a very large commission, and I've seen 10, 20 years. So. You, how about the ground leases where like Miami Dade or something, they sign 99 year lease? Yeah, sometimes these government entities sign 99. But do they pay commission, or you just have to get a commission? Like Look, there's a, there can always be a commission, yeah. I think. Uh, note that commission. Or it's negotiable, I found. So, you know. And who would you go see for someone in the county? Well, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Someone in the government. So, just know that for ground leases, remember, they're prime corners. Your client's responsible for building the building and then paying all the expenses and signing a long term lease. Why are you doing that? Because you want that prime corner of 100,000 cars per day. And the build to sue? They build it for you, or they give you like a ten dollars. No, line you're, for the ground lease. You're gonna build your own yeah. building. But it says build to suit. Do they pay? Like, do they work with you on that to build it, or do they have their contractors build it? You know what? It's always negotiable, but usually, yeah, the ground lease. You're building yourself. Yeah, you're building yourself. The the landlord's gonna have some criteria. They're not gonna allow you to maybe do That's certain cool. things, but most likely you're gonna build your own building. Yeah. <laughs> They'll probably let you build the highest and best use on the time. Right. It, it, it's in their benefit. They're going to want to match up their property, their, their, their parking. Mm. And, and you, know those, you know the big shopping centers like they have the out parcels, yeah. their own freestanding building? A lot of those tenants do ground leases on that mm. land. So like Starbucks might do their own little building with a drive through you know, ground lease at a shopping center. Um, let's talk about space measurements. Gross building area, rent is paid on this number. So, you know, the, the general gross square footage of the building. Usable is the actual space you use. Um, you know, they might, they might bill you for the, the whole area, but really, like, there's a closet that you can't use, so that's why, you know, I call it the usable area. Common area, we all know that's, the, that's this area where there's hallways and elevators that's shared by everyone and bathrooms. Um, so just know these terms. Contract rent, that's the actual rent you're going to be paying. And then, like I mentioned, taxes, insurance, maintenance, base rent, overages, percentages, uh, ground lease, I talked about that land only, cam charges, mm -hmm. common area maintenance, exact base securities, park, and all that. Could you, could you go back to that slide for a second? Yeah. My, 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 my girl over here missed it. Sure. There's questions on anything, George? Don't you have sale lease back? Sale lease another, that's basically where, um, you know, a, a client might purchase the property and then they lease it back. So yeah, it's pretty it's straight up. I haven't, but like a lot of the big companies do that. Maybe Publix does that. I'm mm -hmm. not sure. We're going to do Q&A at the end just because you okay. intend to answer a lot of the questions as, as we go. Right. And then I'll ramble. Liquidity. How fast can you take your asset and bring it to cash? You know, convert it to cash. Land is not liquid, you know, mm -hmm. but a building might be. Leverage, like I mentioned before, using uh, financing and then getting income over that financing amount. Positive leverage, I mentioned. If anybody says, so what's the yield? That just means what's the return, what's the investment performance. Cash flow, income after debt service. So what's the cash flow? All uh, right, if the you know, interest rate is 5% and you're bringing in, you know, money, the amount over the debt is you know, your cash flow. Cap rate, everybody know that NOI divided by the purchase price gives you your cap rate. Cap rate doesn't mean anything. It doesn't what? Doesn't mean anything. Yeah, exactly. You can also work backwards too. Um, you know, if you have a purchase price, then you can figure out 
what is the NOI, you know, so. Someone says, you know, cap rate, just know that. All right, let's get into the, let's close some deal stuff. So who wants to buy, great, now what? You wanna be this guy on top, who's ready, pumped up, ready to go? Or do you wanna be this guy who's like, oh my God, I didn't take the intro class, right? Or, 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 I took the intro class. You might need a tutor session. So I'm gonna just talk about buyer and tenant rep first. All right, so you get a call, you, you, you get, um, this is what I do. You get a call or you get a referral from someone. So you wanna determine what the prospect wants. First thing you do, sound enthusiastic on the phone. Hello, this is Don, I can definitely help you. You pick up the phone, hey, you know, what are you looking for? Okay, blah, blah, blah. you write it down, you've already shot yourself in the foot. So sound enthusiastic, sound like you knew what you're talking about, sound confident, and that's you're on your way to closing the deal. Searching for space, all right? Two things I use normally, CoStar and LoopNet. If you don't know CoStar and LoopNet, um, I'll schedule uh, a CoStar training here at the office. They'll take you through it. At the end, I might have some time to go over it. And then, um, you know, these are the two commercial avenues you use to find properties. So if you don't know it, hop on, mess around with it. We can go from there. Um, create a report, filter out the good and the bad. Like I mentioned from your initial, initial meeting, write all the criteria down, basically go through all the properties, make sure you, you don't send something that's not on there that's just gonna throw the client off. You know, similar to what you do in residential. If you find a location, you, it seems like something's going on with it, it might be the perfect location, well track it down. Look up the property on the tax roll. If it's owned by a company, then you can go to sundays.org, look at who is the founders of the company, and then try to track them down, call them, you know. Um, that could be more tricky, CoStar has tools that allows you to find out who the true owner is. So, you know, there's, there's ways to do that. So just because a commercial property is not listed, doesn't mean it's not for sale. Anything for sale, though, right around, you know, right around. So moment. question, does yeah. the CoStar give you like demographics, like if they're looking for to put a restaurant in a certain Absolutely, you know? there's reports you can do that allow you to get traffic counts, demographic counts, um, tons of things. That's, that's something that we can schedule another day, but that's great to have. And a client will love if you send them, look at this corner, 50,000 cars per day, all right? The income's between 50 and 60,000. Makes you look better. And there's a way to organize it too, so, you know. Group that has that as well, right? I think they do, but it's- And the demographics do. Mm -hmm. Is there any other website for demographics? Yes, there is. Um, there's, you know what, there's like a US, government one mm -hmm. that you can see demographics. I don't know how accurate it is, mm -hmm. but there's, you know, definitely. Mm -hmm. And the traffic one too. There's traffic uh, one, yes. I think the, or something the Department of Transportation yeah. can give you that. Yeah. Um, and you know, if you, if you can't figure out who it is, knock on the door. Nice to say hi, and blah, blah, blah. I have someone interested in this property, or, you know, if you're trying to get the listing, <laughs> Basically say, you know, hi, my name is X, you know, Don Shapiro. I wanted to find out the status of this property. I might be able to help you. And then we kill them with the presentation, etc. So make sure you follow up. Persistency is key. Don't overdo it and call every 10 minutes, but you know, email, oh, how can I help you? Text message, you know, follow up's key. It is because it shows the person you're working and etc. When they're ready, you're gonna prepare an LOI. I'm gonna go over the next slide. LOIs are nine non-binding. Just know that normally. So just because someone has an LOI doesn't mean they can't back out last minute. We want to get to the lease signing, um, but that's basic, you know, basic stuff right there. Then for preparation of contract, there is a commercial contract we can prepare. There's also lease templates, but really, you know, you kind of sometimes if it's a long-term deal, you want to have a lawyer. So, so you know what my thoughts are always that that commercial deals vary from deal to deal. There's no same deal and every property has different issues, different rules that, that traditionally I love to do an LOI and let the attorneys handle most of the leases uh, <coughs> unless they know there's a ready prepared lease for that. Yeah, it's commission agreement. Obviously my favorite part, most important part. When you're, you're dealing with a landlord or, or another broker, they should have what's called a co-broker agreement on file. All right, 
make sure when um, you know you get this and make sure it gets signed by George or sometimes you can sign it before the lease gets executed. If it's a commission agreement, you can forge my signature on it. <laughs> yeah. I promise, I will record and say it's mine. Should it be provided after LOI? Which one I, I, I think, well, I have it on my LOI, but I like to also send it too with the LOI. Or okay. mm -hmm. you can ask for it before. It covers, you yeah. Introduce. And always, always ask, what is your co-broker fee? Or what is your commission, you know? Um, and remember, if they sign the lease too, it can, the lease can say, look at the co-broker agreement, but make sure you have that signed when the lease gets signed too, because. And if it's not signed, you won't get paid. Yeah, because if it's not signed, you won't get paid. I mean. I mean, have you ever negotiated to get paid on an option up front, or you always get paid on an option? Commission's always, always negotiable, normally options. You get paid when is, 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 is um, you get paid when the option is executed. Yeah, yeah, when the option is executed, and sometimes they don't like to pay you on the options, but just know, that sure option goes. after the lease cycle, you can get paid sometimes. Have you ever actually gotten paid on an option? Because I thought it was only on the initial lease um, I have to think about that. I don't think I have. No yeah. one follows up after five years, you forget. But they yeah, should. Right. It's not like residential. <laughs> it's not like it's not like five years. Yeah, yeah, I won't forget. A couple tips. So all offers we got in the LOI. <laughs> the LOI, I think so. But, uh, the yellow eye is similar to your contract lease. That's what it is in commercial terms. Letter of intent. So you can do this for sale, you can do this for lease. We have a template on RESF Nation under Files, Facebook page, which I'm gonna show you next. But it's very very simple and you can edit it. So if your client has something specific they wanna add, like I wanna be the only coffee place in the center, that's exclusivity, so they can put that in there. So this LOI, um, basically gonna go over, You know, I made it look nice, I put my little logo. This is a space number, this is the size of the space. You know, the LOI is the basic terms. You're coming to that mutual understanding of everything's understood, but the, the lease is another monster, let's call it, which I'll get into next. The use, they normally have their own LOI. Gamer. Yeah. Is, is it working still? Most, most of landlords, they have their own proposal on FAR LOI. So before you waste an hour drafting this up, ask them for a proposal because they might take your your proposal and ball it up and throw it in the trash. <laughs> Straight up. It's in true. their little mini heat trash can, you know? Yeah. So ask them for the proposal because proposal is the same thing as an LOI because you don't want to waste your time. But sometimes they might say, oh, send me an LOI. Let me draft the LOI. So that was basic stuff. Lease terms, you could put initial term of 10 years, two options. Options are always good for tenants because, you know, they have, the option. they have the option, they have the rate, and they could potentially lock in the rate. You never know what this market. Base rent here, you'll see, uh, $55 per square foot. Commercial, if you guys don't know, you have to pay sales tax on commercial, 7%. So just know, at the end of the day, you have to add 7% on the total lease value, and they have to pay that. Uh, additional expenses, this one is $24 per square foot. This was my triple net charge that gets passed through. So this is expensive. This is 55 plus 24. So this is $79 total. It's an expensive lease. That's like, no, 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 no. Coral Gables, Miracle Mile, Prime. Increases each year, your, your, your uh, rent's gonna go up. Try to get it as low as possible. If you're repping the landlord, you want to obviously high as possible, but Two, three, four, five percent is standard. Um, someone throws ten percent on there. That's crazy. So just know that that's kind of the average range. Lease commencement date. That's when the lease starts. Rent commencement date is when you pay rent. When you actually start to pay. So if your rent commencement day is past your lease commencement day, you might have a period of rent abatement. Anybody remember what that is? Yeah, it's free rent. Free rent. Free rent. Gotcha. So <coughs> delivery of the premises. Um, here, you know, this is important. You want to make this is like kind of like you're doing the walkthrough. Thanks for clearing that. Uh, doing the walkthrough, and you want to make sure that everything's going to be set up the way it should be. So here, the walls got demolished. Uh, carpets. It's mine. I'm sorry. The, uh, the landlord's getting, um, you know, in the HVAC. HVAC. So you Thank guys you. know it's the central. System that Donnie, have you ever seen sublease on retail? Right to sublease on retail, but that's the only one I've never seen. Yeah, that's very possible. Yeah, sublease. It just 
On the main lease, it should have a provision about subleasing. You can do it or not. Because mm. it's really small, good. On small leases, do you do this letter of intent yourself, or do you always have your the on a small lease? If it's like a, they probably don't have a proposal on file. Because what I've no, what I've seen in the past is a lot of the bigger companies with good reads, you know, spaces have proposals. So you just ask them. So any office building should have a proposal. Mm -hmm. This building should have a proposal on file. You know. And all big shopping centers. Yeah. Exactly. But, 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 but the, the, the smaller, it's a simple lease. Mm -hmm. And that's a simple letter of intent. You might just not have all these things in there, like, like rent, you know, dates, compared to start dates, you know. And you just point out all the key things that you want to negotiate. Yeah. Then you if, there's, if there's anything that, that your client asks for that's specific, make another field. Number. Right. Put it I in mean, front of them. I could put number 18, you know, here. Um, let's call it. Um, uh, TI dollars, right? Tenant improvement allowance. Mm -hmm. Landlord, this is what I'm proposing then. Landlord to give tenant twenty dollars mm -hmm. TI dollars. Well, so, the assignment. Right, you can ask. Assignment's a great one. You want to be able to assign a lease because maybe your tenant has an, the entity. They don't know what it's going to be. So. Or they want to sell. Yeah. One tip also: whatever you add, make it short and sweet. Right. Less is more. Mm -hmm. Okay. Don't tell us a story. Yeah, and if, and if you get guys get confused about the language, because I know a lot of these lawyers sometimes draft and it's a little difficult to understand, just put it in basic terms and they'll get the point. And then once the lease comes, you know, then you can go back and forth on that. So, additional items, like I mentioned, I mean, put nothing here. Personal guarantee, let's talk about that for a second. Um, so if a company signs a lease and asks for a personal guarantee, that just means that the person whoever is in charge, the CEO, they are liable for the lease. Meaning that if the company defaults, the landlord is going to go after the CEO personally. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the time, personal guarantees we don't like, but they're, they're necessary because the company is new or just doesn't have the dollars to make the landlord feel comfortable. Um, there's also what's called a letter of credit which is basically the tenants putting dollars into a bank account mm -hmm. that gets held, and then if someone def if the tenant defaults, the landlord can take money from that intermediate account. Kind of no like bank extra. does that because I tried to do one yeah. and I messed up the deal because no bank would touch their, their letter. Okay. They'll say, no one in this bank is gonna sign your letter because it's not approved by their attorneys. Right. Um, so how, how do you get them to do that? Right, right. There was one that I used a long time ago. Is that like smaller banks that do that? Smaller or? banks, probably for sure. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, no, would, I haven't seen letter of credit that much. I've seen more personal guarantees. But can you do? Um, can you use their own letters? Like you could use like Bank of America has one. You could use their own letters mm -hmm. and send it to the. Yeah, you can. To the letter. No, for sure. A lot of the managers and stuff don't mm -hmm. even know they do, like, but there's yeah. usually a department that, yeah. that handles that. Mm -hmm. All they have to do is open a CD and then the, mm -hmm. the, department, oh, they do? the department will take care of it. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about the other side. So I just gave you a basic... Um, so when the LOI gets signed, of course, you're going to move to the lease phase and you're going to have an attorney. They might, they're, most likely the landlord is always going to send you the lease and then your attorney is going to make changes to language, let's call it. But normally I've seen that once it gets to the lease stage, if you if you were clear about your LOI and the basic terms, the deal is gonna get done because there's a mutual understanding between both parties. They both spend time going through it, you know, et cetera. So just know that once you head to the lease phase, if there's no curveballs, you should be good. I've seen most of the time. Let's talk about seller and landlord rep. You know, imagine this guy hired you. He wants you to uh, retire. Yeah, go fired, but you want to keep them because he's got a lot of properties and you, you want to sell one and sell them lunch. So, all right, so let's let's talk about step one, how I go about it. Learn the market of the subject property, the property that you might be repping. Learn about the, the comps around the area, learn about the, the, le the lease terms, etc. So, you know, you want to kind of know that market before you go into a meeting with someone because if you don't know the area, then you're gonna shoot yourself in the foot. I mean, Coral Gables office space, let's say it's around 35 to $40. If I go to the owner of this building and they say, oh, well, I think I could lease this space for $25. I don't know what I'm talking about. He's gonna look at me and say, no, you're fired. It's gotta pay you fire. So um, bring the listing presentation with you. George, 
actually, um, the listening presentation is where? It's on RSF Nation. So you can, you can tweak that one. What you might want to do is do your research and add that to the presentation. So you can tie it all into one, you know? Have it ready to present. You already did your homework. It looks good when you show up and you're prepared. You're going to have a better chance of getting the listing, mm -hmm. you know. What are you? You're not going to get it if you're not prepared. Right. You're going to highlight all your stuff, strengths, et cetera. Um, George gives a presentation. He can tell you about, you know, we're a cutting edge company, technology wise. I mean, a lot of these commercial brokers, I'll tell you the truth, they're dry, they're boring, they, they don't, like, they suck at marketing. They really, really do. I mean, it's way more competitive. You know what? I'm glad you brought that up. Just because commercial tends to be a couple years behind residential. You know, commercial, keep in mind, there's an old school. It's a big reputation business. It, it's a big, you know, um, prospecting business. So they're, they're very delayed in the times. So, so keep this in mind that the future of commercial, without a doubt, is video. Without a doubt in my mind, it's video. I've seen... Uh, listings with one or two pictures. I swear to you, they don't no show these. Yeah, more no, just outside the building. Uh, it's horrible. I mean, it, there's no video walkthrough. So if you hit them with that angle and open up their eyes, then that's a, definitely a way in. So bring a listing agreement. You know, if he's ready to sign it right there, and he signs, and you sign, you have an agreement. You're, you're good. Don't don't you know be proactive. I, I I find don't sit back and get oh well email you the the listing agreement later. Of course, if they don't want to sign, don't pressure them to sign. Let them take their time to see it. But you know, bring the agreement so you know they have it there. Oh, here's the agreement. You know, what do you think? Okay, try to get them to sign. Do these big companies that manage shopping centers and stuff? Do you know what they charge? Like a ten percent too, or eight percent, or they're um, not doing that for big shopping centers? As far as on your on side, the management. Management. yeah, management. commission on management. Property management. Property management. Uh, uh, the big ones, I mean, I would probably assume 10%, but I'm not 100% sure. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so schedule your video, schedule your drone shoot. A lot of times with commercial, you need to show what's around the area. You know, you can fly the drone around, show that there's a new project down the street. That gives you a great vantage point, or there's new um, office big building being built that's going to add to your retail. So that's, those are things to highlight. Familiar yourself with, familiarize yourself with the property, you know, know what you're talking about, know the zoning of the building, just, you know, do your basic stuff. You're going to list on the big three, I call it, LoopNet, CoStar, MLS. So if you don't know how to do those, that's another class, but just know that most likely in the commercial world, you're not going to find properties on the MLS. You will, it's always, you always want to have it on there because the exposure, but really the markets co-star and that. So those are very important. Yes. Yeah? If you compare co-star and LoopNet, what uh -huh. is better because I know, you know, you need to play. Well, I mean, the you know what, co-star is the dad, LoopNet is a little brother, they're related. <laughs> co-star, co-star bought LoopNet. So, uh -huh. so, so okay. keep in mind that LoopNet is more of a consumer, like a consumer professional site yeah. where, where Non-professionals and professionals tend to look into it. CoStar is really strictly professionals and research. Um, yeah. For me, Don hit it right, which you need the big three. Let me tell you why. There's 3,500 commercial brokers in South Florida. There's 43,000 residential agents, and I promise you that when, when somebody comes to a residential agent with a big deal, they only know the MLS first. So for me, you know, having it where the whole entire real estate community can see it and where the commercial real estate community, I think it's really covering your basis. And, and I've been seeing more and more that the MLS is very effective. Yeah, very. The MLS effective. is effective because a lot of these websites they syndicate. upload over, yeah, syndicate overnight. So they upload, and some people will find your property on random websites just because it's on the MLS. Mm -hmm. But you want to be on all three. You want to also check both. I mean, CoStar tends to lag a little bit, but it's got more information. So you want to check both and know both. So remember, this is the plan. You know, learn about the property, come prepare with a listing presentation, um, highlight our strengths. Remember, commercial people, they're, they're old, they're dull, we blow them out the water, bottom line, we really, we really do. Know the big three, and you know, close the deal. Do you know what's that website for future constructions that are happening? There's no um, 
uh, per, per condo? Spot, condo? No, for all, all the things that are being developed in Miami, there's like a website. You don't know what to call? No. Um, well, they were that. That. Usually, usually new construction, I read about it in the real deal. Yeah, you the know, real deal? The, the real deal. Because the, the, they were doing that thing. Residential, you have condo, you know, condo vultures has their own website. Yeah. That has our stuff. Let me, let me talk a little bit about the best part of this class, how we get paid at commissions. Commercial sales, right? No tenant commercial sales, 3% is not standard like it is. In residential, we know we're getting 3% most of the time. Um, commercial, you gotta remember that you might get one to 3%. You know, you might think, oh, well, it's kind of crappy that I'm giving up 1%. But also note that there's not many commercial properties that are cheap. You can't, you know, go find a, I mean, you can, but most commercial properties are expensive. I don't know if you guys, I would probably say 500,000 plus. Mm -hmm. So it works both ways. I mean, the property is more expensive. You might take less commission, but you know, the property is more expensive. Um, commercial leasing, three to 5% to one side is the standard. So, and, and usually in commercial lease, you get paid on the whole lease. So if it's a five year lease, you know, five years, they're gonna pay you the commission up front. And they usually pay one half when you sign and execute the lease, you give the kind of gives the time. And then the other half comes after the rent commencement period starts. So when the so say there's a free rent period for the first four months, right? This is four months. That's right now because you your, your five looks like an S, and, and your five months looks like scribble scrap. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. So check this out. We have a five year lease. Yeah, right? five year lease. Five year lease. How much is the lease for? Lease is for a million dollars. A million dollars. The total value of the lease is one million. So, so, so that would do what? Two hundred thousand dollars a year. Yeah. Okay. So so two hundred million a year times five. A million dollars, right? Okay, so for the five-year term, okay, you get paid half of it when? when, you, when you get paid half when your client signs and it's a deposit. Oh, okay, so you have an executed lease. Sign and deposit. Yep. You get 50% commission. And remember, the, the, the lease value is... 3% of a million dollars is 30,000. So they're gonna give you $15,000. And it's not that easy to hit a million dollars, believe it or not. If you're in a high retail area, the prices, remember, some of these high retail areas, the prices could be $150 a square foot. So for example, last year, um, Brickle City Center, my clients, they're a big uh, company, and I'll show you them later. They signed a seven year lease, right? They only have a 1,300 square foot space. The total deal was worth about $50,000 commission. I've already got paid half of it. By the way, that's smaller than his office. Yeah. So just know, even a, a law firm, for example, if they occupy 4,000 square feet of space, they're a big firm, but they're gonna sign that five-year lease and they're paying Coral Gables rates. They're down the street. I mean, that's equivalent to a million dollar sale. Let me ask a question. 50% is paid in signing and the other 50% is paid when? Rent commencement. So, Meaning, so first, when they pay the When they rent. start, so for example, if there's free rent, you have to wait till the free rent period's over. Once they start paying rent again, is when you'll get the second half. They normally pay about th within 30 days and you send an invoice. Um, Does everybody understand this? Yeah, pretty simple. You know, fight for renewal commissions. I mentioned um, business opportunity is sale. If you have a business and they're selling it, the general Tony will tell us about this more. Um, ten, I call Tony when I have a got business opportunity for ten percent. On your nose, you got black ink. Oh, I have black ink in my face. Yeah. 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 I'm live on the internet, you know. There you go. So, so you know what? Stay here? Yeah. Stay here? Stay here. Alright, don't worry. We're in warrior mode, so I'll keep going. I know your face out Yeah. You can't even really see it. Alright. So anyway, business, when you sell a business, buy a business, 5%. Why? Most likely because the business is going, you know, crappy and they're willing to pay more commissions. A lot of these investors that, um, you know, they're coming from these countries, they need to get the, the visa, the EB-5 visa, whatever you want to call it, 
they have a certain amount they need to spend, so if they want to buy a business that's already existing, you know, they're desperate to get that, so they'll pay the, the dollars, you know, so. I heard on the one time, I'm waiting for Georgia to come in, but, and you were saying that you get paid the commission up front, but is ever there an instinct that, that you can't, once we get paid our commission, can they still back out of it or something? That's called, George, cl that's called, I haven't seen that. Um, you remember that one lady that got paid a commercial commission and then she, the, the people wanted the commission back? Yeah, my last What's the... Yeah, what, what, what's the commission? So check Once this out. you get paid commission, so, it's done. So, so check this out. They're paying you a commission to bring a willing and able buyer. Okay. okay. Now, if that willing and able buyer defaults on that right. agreement, it has nothing to do with your agreement. Right. So I'll give you an example. If they hire me to cook a cheeseburger, I'm going to cook that cheeseburger and I'm going to serve the cheeseburger. If you go over there and give the cheeseburger to somebody else, it's not my fault. It's not my fault. Oh. You told me to make the cheeseburger. Right. Mm. Like, so you guys didn't have to give that commission. So once commission is paid, that you're done. Yeah, it's, oh, yeah. Oh, it's oh. great too. I mean, you know, sometimes there's an instance where the tenant leaves after a year, and you got paid them all five years. That's the good part about commercial. Um, let's talk about trust me. That, that they, they tend to do some good due diligence on yeah, their clients yeah. once they. Uh, oh, yeah. Let's talk about like local tenants. Kind of just think of these things. Where do you eat? Where do you shop? You know. You, you might know the person uh, in your local, your local pizza joint or let's call it your local restaurant and then you've known them for years. Have you ever asked them? Hey, have you guys wanted to expand? The Destino's gynecologist in the bottom corner. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. T, right? Mr. T. Who's your CPA? You know, who's your mechanic? These are all, who's your, who's your doctor? Doctors are great, by the way, because they, they sign long-term leases and... Landlords love them. Landlords love them because, you know, they're doctors. And they put a lot of money into it. Oh, no. you know what Question. If you sign the building and the business, you will come in to do two contracts, right? No, normally, um, if you're doing both, then you just sell the, the real estate and you, you, you list the assets for sale. Meaning, if you're selling a restaurant and you own the building, then you'll, you might include in the notes or the listing. All equipment, you know, all equipment's included in the sale, plus, uh, you know, the, they call it intangible asset or the, the financials and, that can be another added dollar amount to that. So if, it, if it's actually a business, like a real money-making business or something, you should get paid on that business of 10%. That's and then you should try to get paid 10% on everything, not 3% because then okay. it, you start doing a scrambled eggs and cheese there. So it's double commission. So try to get paid 10% yeah. on everything. Yeah, I found that most businesses, the real estate's not for sale. Um, and if it's commercial down 10% on it. The way I would try to pitch it is um, you're selling the business yeah. and the property is included. Don't right. say I'm selling the property and the business is included. Yeah. That's how you word it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? By the way, Tony is the number one business salesperson in all of our right. yeah. history. History. I would try no, to say that. No one is even going to come close to another thing. <laughs> Direct mail, internet, um, you know, that's always a good thing to do. George can talk about that more, kind of marketing wise. But just so, so, so you, know, you know what I okay you're about to talk about some content. yeah Perfect. yeah so someone calls you about commercial real estate remember talk to them sound enthusiastic qualify qualify them you know um, if they're I'm gonna talk about new concepts or people the that want to say it again the mall that you said how to get people into yeah the yeah we we'll talk about that definitely just just know that you know you want to qualify because commercial is more grinding and more on the phone and digging. Um, so you, you don't want to take on something that the person is might not have their, their stuff together, a new business or etc. Um, question. Well, I mean, what do you look for in like uh, if someone is either wanting to buy or lease? Uh, <coughs> like, what do you look for as far as how do you know they're qualified to buy? Right. Well, if they're qualified to buy, if they have cash, that's great. It's just like residential. If they're financing, then, they, then you can get a pre-approval. Um, so, SBA is a special program that which no one applies for. Yeah, huh? Which no one applies for. Yeah, it's been less and less, but it's um, a program that you put less down and get qualified if you're an owner user of that business. Uh, I'm going to talk about that in a second, though. It's going to be more clear. Search for the property, present the offer, close. Let me go to, 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 to qualify. We have a lot of new agents here, and, sure. and, and it happens to all of us where one of our friends or somebody that we know wants to start a business randomly. Yeah. With no experience. Yeah. So can, can you talk a little, a little bit about that? 
you know, um, how important it is that to, number one, you know, when you're dealing with a new person, to sort of figure out if they have a plan, a business plan, if they're going to I'm going to get to that. Okay. Absolutely. All right. New concepts. That was my next slide, actually. So, they have a new concept, right? What's your concept? Well, you want to open an Italian restaurant. Really, um, you know, do you, do you have a menu? Do you have other stores? No, we don't, but we just want to open it. That to me is... My grandma's Italian, trust yeah, me. Yeah, <laughs> my grandma's Italian. That to me is kind of a red flag, and you know, maybe they just don't have their ideas organized, but really for these new concepts, the landlord is the one that's gonna scrutinize it, because the landlord wants to know, okay, what's your track record? Do you have other locations? Okay, your new concept, fine, you don't have other locations. What's your business plan? Your, your new concept, your first step, to make that business is to have a business plan. You have if you don't have a business plan, and when you're just writing in on the yellow pad of paper, you know, most likely it's gonna be very tough for you to work a deal and you're gonna shoot yourself in the foot because they don't have, you know, even if they have a website, a basic website, that's something, so. How about if they're backed by someone, by someone with money? Because let's say, oh look, my uncle just came right. out of town, he has money, he wants to back me into my new car. Even if they show you a bank account with $10 million, mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's good. They do like a personal guarantee to that person, like you do with like a tenant, or like a university student, they tell them your parents gonna be the one guaranteeing that rent, you know? What I'm yeah, saying? yeah, I mean, if they're, they're a new concept, like, or they're a new business, you know, if it's, if it's, really, if it's retail, you'll come across this a lot, because retail, the landlord wants to have a diverse uh, tenant mm -hmm. roster, if it's office and you're just using the office space, you know, for office use and their new concept, it's okay as long as they have financials. But really, this applies to, let's call it retail a lot, um, or maybe even a little industrial because, you know, if you have this industrial space and you, and you're this this company, you need to be in that type of work to use the space. But I'm going to show you kind of, um, you know, these things. So, do you have a website? Do you have renderings? Do you have product? You know, do you have something to show me with your landlord? It's okay if you're a new concept, but you need to you need to make sure they're prepared to show you something on paper that they have in the legitimate business, etc. And with the people from Brazil, you can pitch them how big they are in another country. He, and listen, that. listen, the people from Brazil yeah. came in with a hell of a business plan, a yeah. hell of a package. I'm gonna show they, you. They had, oh, you are. Yeah. You can just say, oh, they have five locations over there. So yeah. So, 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 so you know what? I can say whatever I want. Mm -hmm. but, but if I show you. Yeah. So so just make sure your your client's prepared, you know, on their own level before you jump into anything. Um, qualifications, you know, are you pre same as finance, uh, same as residential. Are you pre-qualified? Will the bank give you a loan for X amount of dollars to buy this office condo or this industrial warehouse? SBA, Small Business Administration, that's a special program they offer, you know, 10% down, um, basically. So if you're an owner user, meaning that if you buy the property, you're gonna use, you're gonna have your business out there. It's different than if you're an investor and you're just buying it and renting it out. Those qualifications might be different. So, um, you know, EB-5 programs I mentioned, um, you can get that. That's basically uh, a foreigner coming in and trying to get a visa and they have X amount of dollars they have to spend on a business with working people and you know they go from there. Also, can you prove your financials on paper? So financials is always one of those you know tricky things or sensitive things. Sometimes you don't want to touch because people are just you know a little weird about showing your money, but these are the questions I ask. Do you have a balance sheet of your company? Do you have tax returns? If not, personal information, do you have bank statements? Show me something relating to you know the dollars you make. I, I, I heard you sort of speak in the past. And uh, so some of the things that you were saying was that when I try to negotiate a good lease, yeah, I, you know, I need good numbers in order to strengthen that. And if I don't have those good numbers, my clients are going to pay top dollar for that lease. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so so touch a little bit on the fact of how the strong buyer really helps negotiate a great lease, and how that mystery buyer or that new starter is going to come in really paying. There's really less room to negotiate in a, in a real. Yeah, home. yeah. The stronger you you look on financials, you know, if you if you're upfront with them and you show them good financial statements and good balance sheets, good tax returns, and you, you know, you basically open up your financial life to them. Um, you're going to have more leverage. The, it's funny how the landlord, you know, you're always trying to make a deal let's say with them or vice versa, and 
they have that power, you know, they, they do what they want. Oh, this is this, this is that. The minute I, I've seen the tables turned where you have a tenant, they have such good financials and there's such a big asset to that landlord that the leverage actually flips back in your position because they don't want to let you go if you're going to sign a 10 year lease, you know? You so the Apple effect. The Apple effect, exactly. Um, they do what they want. They come into these centers and they say, we're going to pay this amount of dollars this, you know, for this term. So just know that financials work with you, not against you. Um, I was talking about, you know, kind of prospecting and that stuff. Try to get the decision maker. So, you know, and you want to get the person that's in charge of buying or leasing. You don't want to um, be talking to a person who's who might not know. You know, the, the front desk person might not, um, just because they say, oh, we're looking for space, doesn't really know. So try to always ask the question, am I, you know, who's the decision maker, who signs the lease? Um, try to get to them when you're, when you're trying to get these commercial deals, etc. All right, let me just show you really quick what I was talking about with new concepts. So this is a, this is a store that I uh, represented and they signed. Okay, so I asked them to put together in a PDF format a presentation about their company. And I basically said, tell me about your company. Tell me about the history of your company. Tell me about your product. Tell me about how many stores you have in Brazil. Tell me, basically give me a, a nice summary. So they went back and I made them after a week. I said, before we start negotiating, put this. So this just gives you an idea of you know, who they are. They have eight stores. This is a little bit old. Um, you know, they're growing, etc. They have these models. Price points of their, their products. This just gives you a basic idea. And this can be for, you know, if you're a restaurant, what's the menu gonna look like? Do you have a logo? Um, you know, brand, etc. So this just gives you a basic idea of what to kind of prepare before you go into those negotiations, etc. Look, look how cool the back. Oh, Steven, there. Look how cool has Instagram, Facebook followers. Talk about yeah. the importance and how they're even putting it on there. Right. Like, I think that speaks value about the power of social media. Right. And that's just their fly or their marketing. You don't have to make one specifically for them. No, they made it for themselves. They made it. Mm -hmm. They made it for me because I requested it. Because Absolutely. they were new concepts. Because landlords, and you know, when you're doing these deals, they tend to don't like foreigners and they don't like new concepts because they think it will fail, mm -hmm. and they want to have a safe, a safe. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I tried to put a, a, a place in from in, into a really Bayside. They weren't having it. Yeah. And then I asked That's them to do something one. like this, and they're like, they weren't having it. It was general. It was general growth properties. The guys like who? What? Yeah. <laughs> Um, a lot of the, the big malls, they, they will look at a new concept, but really make sure that you have a lot of information on the concept, you're prepared, you give, open up your life to them. Give them financials, give them your, your marketing package for your concept, because it's tough to get into these malls, but it is possible, and they do pay commissions, and they do have to do long-term leases. So know that you can, but you just need to have that plan. Otherwise, they're gonna ball up your, you know, your, your one-page crappy summary that you emailed and throw it in the trash. It's like that. Okay. So, so that just gives you an idea of, um, I think that's pretty much it. Um, yeah. At which stage you disclose in the clients? Because, you know, you can sometimes have an issue if you're new in this business and they just basically go to that. Say, say that again, like which stage do you... Yeah, yeah, like for example, after LOI, or you mentioned that, you, I mean, somehow to protect you as an agent of the, of the client, when you disclose an everything. Oh, okay, so like, how do you protect yourself with the landlord and the client? Yeah. I always, when, I, when, I'm, when I'm meeting with a client, you always want to tell them, you know, basically, Kind of how, it, yeah, yeah. Talk about how we work together. Yeah, how we work together. You know, I'm going to be the broker. I, I kind of always say, you know, listen, I'm going to send you properties. Um, find out, maybe ask them if have you worked with anybody else. This is how it works in my industry. But you always want to register yourself 
When you show a property, you want to be there most of the time. If you're not there and you can't make it, register yourself, whether it's an email, whether it's a document, you're stating my client is XYZ, represented by me, so there's no discrepancy. So always do that up front because the last thing you want is, you know. Keep in mind that real estate, we have this very powerful term called procuring cause. Yeah. So if you have evidence that you were working with this client at an earlier date than the other person has, you have the right to go after that commission. So, so feel free to put that person's name on an email, mm -hmm. send it out, and just make sure that, that it, it's registered. Now, if, if it's not listed on the MLS, if it's listed on the MLS, you're definitely protected. If it's not listed on the MLS, you're gonna to wanna to figure out what they're paying for commission and, yeah, and, yeah. and then send your... You know, if, it's, if it's not listed on the MLS and you come across something, ask the owner um, if they're paying commission, and then definitely have a commission agreement sent to them that they can sign because they won't pay you. Yeah. So, so keep in mind that there's two big differences. If it's on the MLS, right. okay, it falls under the MLS rules, right. which really most, protects the agency. And most likely the commercial stuff's not gonna be in the MLS, so you need oh, to get that co-broker agreement. Or yeah, but I've never seen. They put the commission there, but it's not like, there's no MLS laws. So, so, so even if it's, if it's there, it can be changed. And then does that apply to um, that problem that I was having with that shopping center guy? And he had talked to a lady before, but I was the one that actually brought the deal to happen. Would yeah. I be protected in that? So, yeah, that, let me, let me what, talk about that. Was that with MLS? So if your client talked to someone before. And they weren't able to make the deal. And they weren't able to make the deal and they bring you in. Mm -hmm. You so still might be able to, hold on. You still yeah. might be able to wiggle a commission, but the, 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 per, the, the client has to hold the power. Meaning they have to tell the landlord, this is my broker, and if you want to make a deal, you have to pay him a commission, he's representing me. And that's, you know. Well, so if it's on the MLS, yeah. it's, it's about procuring costs. Sure. Let me tell you why. Because if I go with you, commercial dime to find a retail spot, and I find it, and Toby's my cousin, and you know no. what? I don't, I don't want to pay you. I can go to landlord and say, I want you to pay him. But no. You were really my procuring cause. Right. But I'm so talking about the landlord's agent. That's what I'm talking about. For sure, I, I hear you. I hear you get you. what I'm saying? So, so, so I know what you're saying, but understand this. Who show, who talked about the property with that person first? All right. But that person does not know that. Answer that question. Them. Answer that question. Who, who, who talked and they don't them? represent the best interest of, of the no, tenant. No, 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 no. I, 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 I just asked you one simple question. Who did they talk to first? For sure. So, so you know what, you mind you can always negotiate, you can always ask, you can always fight. Yeah. But if, if there's no wiggle room, the 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 agent sure. procures, you know, that transaction you won't tell you to pay. Sure. And, and and listen, I've seen commissions be taken away from an email blast. Yeah. I mean from, from an email, hey Tony, wow. look at these five properties that I have for you. That's it. Mm -hmm. Tony never talked to that person again, they moved out of the realtor, and the realtor came back, look at this email, March 5th. Tony bought it March 31st. It's crazy. It's, sure, it's, yeah. it's that simple. But you know what? It really protects that agent who gets jacked by, you know, yeah. by a cheating buyer. Yeah. You know, I go in and I show you the property, you get your cousin to cut me out of commission. No, there's a law there that protects it. And sure. every listing agent that sees that you came with somebody else is gonna tell that other agent, hey man, this guy came with somebody else. Let's just piggy, let's talk about like how to find clients. So like I mentioned, piggyback off residential. Everybody who buys a residential place or rents they, they're gonna have a job, they're gonna work in a commercial place, you know, commercial surrounds us. So ask about it, you know, who, you know, oh, where do you work? Oh, are you expanding? Use social media, you know? Um, I know you're residential, most of you are residential agents, but also you have a license, you could do commercial too. We're great because our company allows you to do both. Other big commercial companies, they, they strictly only do commercial, like I mentioned, they're dull, they're boring, etc. But we we do we do both, and we do it both good. Networking groups. I'm part of BNI, which uh, I'm a, it's, I love it. I have to wake up every Wednesday morning very early, but I go once a week. It's a networking chapter. I'm the only commercial real estate uh, broker in that chapter. It's category exclusive, so you know no one else can join the chapter. And I've gotten business from it. You know, tons of business <coughs> from it, big deals from it. Um, if you're not part of BNI, maybe there's some other networking groups that you can use. Um, George, any other ones? Yeah, yeah, for sure. My favorite is, is politics. Right now, we're going through a political season. I promise you that whoever is volunteering, walking, and knocking is rich and has interest in something. And more importantly, if you pick a candidate that's really just starting off, okay, you become their real estate guy as they grow. 
So yeah. keep in mind, look local, look at young political type of boy in there, and make sure you you align with what what the, you know they 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 need. Yeah. And you know volunteer from from the, the from the beginning. And for me, that's very powerful. I'm involved in the Latin Builders Association, um, and the Latin Builders Association is surrounded by attorneys, you know, accountants, sure. contractors, sure. boom, and all these people need office spaces. They all want to buy yeah. in the future. Um, the chamber is also a great place to go. Yeah, the chamber is uh, very good too. For, for those of you guys that volunteer for charities, if you do Camilla's house, um, if you do anything, you know, I, I promise you, those that are volunteering next to you tend to be some people that are giving back and don't have to work that day. And yeah. they, they tend to be better financially. And note that, you know, uh, relationships are developed long term when someone trusts you. So in the beginning, you know, if you're showing up and you're not really participating, you know, it's not going to pay off. But over time, if you participate and you network, you Meet more people, you're gonna you're gonna get generate business. So I always think that we should be in one networking group, at least. yeah, at least. Um, it takes up a little bit of time, you know. Obviously, we have lives, other things going on, um, but uh, you know, it's it's something good to, to be in. Um, your inner circle, you have your friends, your family. Let them know I can help you with, um, you know, commercial as well. So don't think that you can't close deals from your inner circle. Um, and you know, internet leads. There's, you know, I've just built a website. I'm going to do some marketing on that. It's not. There's not really um, like a Zillow of commercial yet, but you know, there's there's ways to research and try to get commercial leads too. Team up. You know, maybe you have someone. You do office. Someone else does retail. Maybe you can market yourselves as you know the office retail team or something like that. Just kind of you know, that's that's another good way. And then. That's pretty much it. Um, anybody have any questions? Specific questions I'm, I definitely could answer. Um, yeah, I have one. I yeah. mean, it, it's, a little, it's not, I don't know if it's better served for after this meeting, but no, ask it. A commissary. Have you ever located a commissary for a client? No. You haven't? No. You have to look for restaurants when they're a cold star and Uber. Yeah, it, it, sounds e it sounds easy to say that, but. Uh, to actually get it, like a commissary is where like you know a restaurant would you know prepare their food for like say they have fifty locations they have like one HQ they, Tony, they prep it Tony so yeah, how many guys have you guys a killer one that we found that we for sale for lease yeah uh, whatever you want how many meals okay well okay. we'll send it to you later but let me ask down the question yeah. the question would be what kind of requirements like uh, so if you type in for example a commissary on LoopNet there's I think one. I, I got emailed one from Kushner, but it's hanging on the market. The right. point is you won't you're find it. You're looking for something very specific. So what what details do I need to look in on an industrial space to have it qualified for a commissary? Right. That's that's something that um, you know you basically you want to find the area you're looking for and then ask ask maybe the agent or the landlord you won't that abuse will be yeah. okay or if it's very specific. You might need to go to the city. Yeah, you won't find it. What you need to find is the grease trap and the hood. Grease trap and, the and the hood. That's it. Because the walking pool and all that thing is good. All you need is the grease trap and the the. the, the story. Uh, so the, the cold, cold storage. In cold storage is that cold storage? You could put it in, in any industrial. Your zone. The only one thing that might affect it if you have high volume use of water usage. I Leo won't allow it large part of the world. Like, well, like, I don't want to take yeah. uh, it. It's okay, it's a raw learning. Yeah. Yeah. Learn that. I learn best from hearing different examples. Yeah, yeah. 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 No, the tra yeah. training's over. This is, this is where we're right. going. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, dive right, I definitely dive right in, but don't be kind of, you know, shy. So, 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 you know what? If I was also looking for a commissary, keep in mind that that is such a unique product mm -hmm. that I might do the opposite. Mm -hmm. I might go to Google and see those that are. You know that aren't for sale. And, and knock on those doors when you're finding those okay. for sale. You know, I, I think that the first sale in twenty has a you know one, the only one that's out yeah. there. And, 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 and for me, you know, I, was, I went and shot it. I was blown away by the facility, how they ran their operation. Mm -hmm. How many meals? You had to buy a cafeteria. What you end up doing is you have to buy a restaurant and then change it. So any of these cafeterias are perfect for you on any of these warehouses. You buy it. You have to really you have to find one that's like going out of business. And you just get the permit. That's all you need. Gotcha. Um, in regards to like kind of how I work, and if you guys don't feel comfortable diving right in, no, like normally, if you want to learn and and close deals, I, I usually go like 50-50. We did that on a deal. We actually just got like a signed 
uh, execute an agreement for a, a, an art school. And um, cool. you know, yeah. 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 Nice. yeah, it was it was a tenth deal, meaning a tenth deal is like for Art Basel, so it was a small deal. But in the future, this large art school might want to expand, and you never know. They want to open a ten thousand square foot place in Wynwood. I mean, we're going to make a huge payday. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of how I work. I definitely I'm open to sharing 50-50, teaching you, walking you the process. But if you have some deals that um, you know you don't want to deal about because you're busy or because it does take time in commercial, I'm not gonna lie. I usually do 25-75, and if if I'm not able to work it, I have a few kind of agents in certain areas that I really you know um, trust, and I have them work it as well. Um, and there's uh, easy referral agreement, it's one page, it's on form simplicity, you know, you feel comfortable. Also, I can write in the email and CC George. I mean, I've never had an issue with anyone here, so. Donnie, on the, there's a way to get office spaces. A lot of office spaces on the first floor, and it's perfect for retail. Yeah. But there's a way to get it where it's not zoned. The landlord won't allow you to do it, but they will rent it to you. There's a way to do it so that you could put someone retail in there. Do you know how, what's like the glitch? Because the landlord doesn't want to tell me or need me. In Hialeah or? or, or, or everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. And the inspectors allow you to do it too. They'll give you a certificate of use and everything. But you just have to know how to. You know, when it comes to changing uses and. You don't change the use. You keep the office space, but it's how you, you say so, your so, 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 so you know what? I need to imagine that if, if I rent an office in the first mm -hmm. floor with windows, Right, I'm asking mm -hmm. you windows, and instead of putting desks in the windows, I put on you know a mannequin with a dome. So you just say that you're not going to sell to the public, you're not going to pitch well, to well, the public. Well, you, well, you know what? I, I need to imagine it. if I was going to skirt the line, I would say this is an office where mm -hmm. you know I well, I already have my own customers, and my customers come to me. Yeah, this is my private office, and this office I sell. Yeah. And this office I sell real estate. I want to just I want to talk about like the, the office market store. deals really quick. Um, I've noticed in commercial, like, it's getting kind of hard to do deals, like, because it's to find deals. Um, I know you had someone shopping center, it's hard to find. So just know that if you're driving a specific area and you see something that looks good, you can, you have access to find out all about it through CoStar. You can find out who's the owner and sometimes even the tenant list or the roster. So just think, just because a property is not listed doesn't mean, like I mentioned, that it's not available for sale. You might have to grind out and call 20 people and that one of them says, oh, I might sell this. But just know that a lot of commercial transactions are, are done kind of off market. So, you know, we have the tools to find out who the decision maker is, who the, you know, the, the correct person is to potentially make a deal. So, and also use your network too. Like on RSF Nation, I'll always post, you know, right now I'm looking for uh, 20 plus units anywhere in Miami. So anybody knows of anything, let me know. You know, if it's not on the market, etc. So, one, one more question. Yeah. On, I feel like a real common thing is like people doing 1031 exchanges. Do you have any experience with 1031? Yeah, the person who's actually looking to buy, they're doing a 1031 exchange. For those of you who don't know, 1031 exchange is basically when you sell a property. You're deferring the you know the, you the gains because yeah. you don't want to pay taxes on them and putting them into another property. So for example, you know someone just sold the property for five million dollars. They have capital gains of two million dollars. You know two M. Let's call it. If they don't put this this. Five million dollars they got into another property. They have to pay the capital gains tax on the it's the money they made, and capital gains tax is not cheap at all. They can end up paying thirty percent, two million, you know, six hundred thousand dollars goes to the IRS. But it has to be an equal like property, right? And yeah. they have to have had it for at least two years, right? Well, it there's, can't there's be a right there's, there's, there's different. No, there's certain criteria that that. That someone in the 1031 exchange specific mm -hmm. will be able to help you, but you. The thing about it is, you're on the clock, meaning mm -hmm. you have to identify a property in a certain amount of days. 60 days. 60 days. Right. I've been closed within what? Six months. Something like that. Yeah. Uh, maybe. It's 45, 45 days. No. No. no, no but you to identify. We'll, we'll find out the answer to that, but 
So if you have someone in 1031 exchange, they're more likely to make a deal because they don't want to pay that capital gains. You know, that's like the best. They, they actually they need to, they need to make a deal on the bottom. Yeah. So, but you know. I guess the question I was trying to ask is like, there's when you do like go on Google and you read it, it's so gray. You know, because mm -hmm. it says like Tony said, like it needs to be a, a like mm -hmm. property. But then you talk to some professionals and I'm like, dude, that's it's so gray. As long as it's income producing, mm -hmm. you're pretty much good to go. But then I had an attorney ask me, they're like, I have a client looking to do 1031, they're selling a place, it's three and a half. I was like, awesome. But they want to put half of it towards an uh, income producing property, but then they want to use the other half for uh, for residential. Like, right. There's no way that's gonna work. But then again, that's something that we're gonna research. I'm gonna find out the answer and we're gonna. How do you get paid on, on any of those trades or anything? Does your client pay you or? No, it's the same. same when deal. you close, yeah. you get paid. Yeah. So when they find a new property, it's the money actually, I guess, sits in an account and then it ends up going to the new property, you know. Don, I have a Facebook question when you're ready. Facebook question, fire away. Cindy, Cindy says, I may have missed commercial Don speaking about LOI, but just wanted to confirm that it is to be used when making a commercial offer, like in the place of a contract to lease mm -hmm. for residential rentals, correct? That is, that is correct, Cindy. It's basically the same thing as a contract to lease. It's not binding and it's a little bit more thorough. I always recommend, like I told the other agents, to ask the landlord for their proposal so you don't waste the time drafting an LOI, taking you an hour, when, they can send, when they're gonna send you one anyway. Also, if we don't have, or also if we do have a generic form, if we don't have one, it'd be great to have one. You said we have one already. We have a generic form. Um, it's under Files, RUSF Nation Facebook page, commercial. And you have to make sure you change all of it because right now the LOI is getting sent to Mickey Mouse. You don't want to send an LOI and then the landlord reads it and it says Mickey Mouse. So. <laughs> You know. Johnny, from what you see in the past, people do respect. Once they have a signed LOI, they normally respect, even though it's Norm not binding. They normally, normally right? LOIs are thorough enough that when you have a signed deal, they're going to move to lease phase, and they were respect. They get worked out. Mm -hmm. Anytime it gets to lawyers talking about language, I found it gets you know the deal gets done. So that's that's a good job. I don't know about. Um, so you put your commission in the letter? I put my commission sure. in the LOI and then I asked for the co-broker agreement as well. And a text message doesn't work. Gangster, gangster, gangster. And I just make it send me a text message too. George, a text message doesn't work, right? So, so, so you, you know what? Um, forget about what doesn't work. Let's think about what works best. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you, you know what? I want it in writing. Mm -hmm. You know, I would hate for you to come into my office and say, George, we gotta buy a commission. And I go, show me where it is and you show me a text. I'm gonna say, Tony, you weren't as professional as you needed to be. Even though we were able to work that one out. Yeah, no, for sure. <laughs> for sure. I, my, it, it, it's not my first choice. My, <laughs> my email's here. If you guys email me, I'll send you a few helpful things. I'll try to get the presentation sent to you, but. Um, well, well, keep in mind, it's on Facebook Live. Facebook Live records the whole entire thing. Mm -hmm. So people will be able to go and see this today, tomorrow, the next day. Don is gonna be looking at the feed. So if you have any questions, put it on the feed. And maybe for the for, till the end of the day today, we'll be answering questions. Yeah, absolutely. And um, there's a commercial glossary that I found online. It's from the board, and it's got a bunch of terms, like those those language terms that I mentioned, just to familiar, familiarize yourself with. So I'll send that to you. And that's just a good thing. This is, if you look at a term and it says abatement period or tenant improvement, you didn't know what it meant. You can look at it easily and determine what you know what it means. Tony, how do you you said your I don't know you said it or not. To search for these multifamily that aren't on the market. That yeah. How how would you go? What I what I recently did yesterday actually mm -hmm. is I go on propertyblast.com. You guys can write that down. Propertyblast.com. It's it's basically a commercial property blast email, and I wrote uh, I did a template. They have a template on there. You can use RDS Fs, which is nicer. And I did a requirement. So I basically said my subject was <coughs> off, looking for off market multifamily properties in this mm -hmm. range. I put all the criteria, you can make it, and then it sends it out. And yesterday I actually got four emails back with off-market deals. What platform was this? What is your property blast? Property blast. Yeah, so, so it's sort of like a want email, wanted. But also, you can put your new listings on there and send them out for a commercial. Do you guys know, there's also one for residential called Fast Flyers. That's $20, and if you have a new listing, it goes to all the residential agents. Not all of them, but. 
Have you used uh, Real Connects before? No. It's actually pretty badass, dude. It's because it's free, which is even more badass. More badass. Well, another thing I want to mention is as RESF Nation, we're a team. So we might have our own individual listings, but use that as kind of a, a resume. If you don't, you know, you've never done a commercial transaction, well, look, our company has done these commercial transactions. For sure. So keep in mind that when, when you are part of RESF Commercial, you inherit our reputation and our legacy. So, so keep in mind when you're showing you know, people what we do, go to our commercial tab, play the video. Before it ends, switch to another video. All right, yeah. that's just my tip. But, but again, you know, we, you know, we've moved properties, we have people with the know-how, so go in there with full confidence that we are gonna be able to deliver, whether it's with you or whether it's partnering up with Commercial Don. Sure, you know? sure, so, yeah. So, so, so keep, 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 keep that in mind. Yeah, we've done, I mean, we've done a lot of commercial transactions here. It's not like we, we've only done a few. We've done enough where we should feel comfortable, you know, talking to landlords and saying, hey, look, we've done these transactions. I mean, three years ago, Jeremy did a four and a half million dollar. Um, he hasn't worked ever since. <laughs> <laughs> just, kidding. just kidding, Jeremy. Just he's not. He's not on it. So. I don't um, think he is. Okay. Yeah, he had a question. I just ignored it. Oh. Um, <laughs> but yeah, he had a Brazilian buyer. They bought a four and a half million dollar office building. You know, he's familiar with commercial, but he's not an expert on it. And, you know, that just goes into the resume of, of, of RESF, you know, so, so these people ask, oh, do you guys do transactions? Yeah, we have. And, you know, I'm sure we can generate some type of a list of past transactions with our oh, office. We have videos of past transactions, it's even better. Yeah. Yeah, that's the one highlight point, like I mentioned. Commercial, these guys, they're old school, they're dry, their marketing flyers suck, they don't know how to organize the information, they don't do video walkthroughs. Um, you know, so that's kind of uh, my take on, on the game moving forward. Uh, and and for, for me, it, it sort of reminds me of 2006, 2007, when the market crashed and I needed to innovate, I needed to do something different, okay? I think the, the, commercial, the commercial market is primed for this type of innovation. And the fact that we have a very old demographics running it, I, I think the question is, can you get in front of, their, of them, mm -hmm. let them know how the commercial market is mimicking the residential market in the way that we search, the way that we research, and how these tools that are very fancy to the residential market can really outperform in the commercial market. And we've seen a great example with my man Tony here and the business brokerage. You know, Tony, every week, you know, I feel like I'm related to Tony. Every week I see Tony for two hours. Yes, two hours, and we are shooting business after business. You know, they don't business. know that. They, people really don't know that. Yeah. Commercial um, realtors, yeah, but business brokers, they don't even know that they exist. People are like, they just go street to street talking to people, so it's a good thing that we do exist, you know, and you just have to let people know that we exist, you know? Because no one knows. Now, well, like, how do you properly price a business when you get the listing? Like, you know, like like a building you could like right. derive from a cap rate, a potential Businesses cap rate. are tricky because, remember, you're, they have equipment that's most likely used equipment, so you really have to, you know, is it like three times like growth? No, no there's there's no there's no formula really. With businesses, I would I would recommend getting a business appraiser to mm -hmm. price the business because sometimes these people put the price of you know the business is failing and they think it's worth yeah. a million. Tony, tell, tell, tell me a little bit about pricing because I know you deal with it all the time. It's from what they make and from what business it is and what they have, what they have inside and where it's at. You know, so it's. So the, 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 there's, there's many factors. There's many yeah. factors. For, for me, when, 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 when I dabble in pricing a business, mm -hmm. um, you know, three times, two and a half times its earnings, mm -hmm. if it's a stable industry, if oh. it's a booming industry, up to 10 times its earnings. Yes. You know, and, and I'll give you an example. You know, a couple years ago, we had the cupcakes, you know, they were booming industry. The, the, the cigarette lighters, the e-cigs, mm -hmm. you know, there was six, 12 months there where, you know, they were making big money. That's a booming industry. Mm -hmm. uh, a declining industry would be sort of like a travel agency. Mm -hmm. You know, you know so, something that's making less and less money or a hair salon that started really good and then sort of slowly lost their, their mm -hmm. traffic. So at that point, you know, you, 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 mm -hmm. two, two times, one time or just, Assets and get rid of the lease. I want to uh, just say one more thing. Obviously, the goal is to try to get listings. I've noticed that when you have listings and people call you and they don't have representation, you, you can take them somewhere else. Yeah, you, you can definitely get them as clients. That's that's big time. Like I had a medical building I just put under contract, but I had 
a doctor, two doctors look at it, and one of them, you know, they didn't have a broker or anything, and they hopped right on it, and now we're looking for an, an office building to purchase, you know, in the five year lane range. So that's another tip. Uh, listings definitely bring clients. Any with other the, questions? With the medical, um, doctors get 100% financing, right? Uh, no, they're they're they have special programs for doctors. They do, right? Well, banks, banks tend to, to be given more favorable terms. Yeah. And that's for the, all the offices that they want to open, not for, for every so, so not for all they want, but all that they can. You know, all they can, and we'll see their we have one in the last. It, it's always going to be the reason. Okay. Doctors, from, from what I know, they're but ultra conservative. They think things through in very easy. That's correct. You don't know. He's a jack of uh, okay. some private. Any other questions okay. for any good banks can lend on any of these commercial properties that you're in? Um like I know Ocean Bank is doing like the majority of the development. If if your client's gonna be an owner user, definitely maybe inquire about SBA. Alex Rivero does commercial lending. I have another guy, Francisco, he's very good as well. And um, you know, they they're aggressive, they get the deal done and you know, they'll stay on top of it. So 